Now, this Republican Party outlook descends from many strands in, in the earlier period of American history, to some extent, as I say, from the American Revolution. It also descends from a view more associated previously with the old Whig Party. Ashworth talks about this very well, um, which emphasized um, what they called the harmony of interests, that in a free society, all levels of society share a common set of interests. In other words, rather than the Jacksonians who talk a lot about class conflict and labor being exploited by non-producers, no, in this it's economic growth benefits everybody. So they you know, and they say the pauper of today is the merchant of tomorrow, so therefore there's no inherent conflict of interest uh, between them. So Republicans talk a lot. This is, this is one of the re things you, will find, you may find odd if you study this period. Republicans talk a lot about the dignity of labor, the importance of labor, but they're quite hostile to strikes, to labor unions. Um, uh, they're not interested in class consciousness. What they're interested in is economic growth, which they claim will benefit uh, everybody. Um, so. The answer to oppressive labor conditions is not to confront the employer, but is to move west. Horace Greeley, the editor of the New York Tribune, of course, with his phrase, go west, young man. If you don't like conditions in the east where factories are growing, immigration is increasing, go west and recapitulate the opportunity to become a farmer or a small craftsman. In other words, the west enables you to get out of the more advanced economic order into an older one where economic independence is still, um, is still uh, accessible, they argue. Now, I should also mention uh, that the free labor outlook is very much one, just like the political world, for white men. It, blacks in the North, free blacks in the North, there are only 220,000 of them out of 23 million population, nonetheless they are there are not really thought about by the people who talk about free labor. The blacks are suffering from serious discrimination in all realms of life, including economic. They have, the notion of upward mobility uh, is, is a bad joke, in a sense, when applied to blacks, because they are stuck in, by prejudice in the most low-paid jobs, unskilled jobs, servants, unskilled laborers, and the opportunity to rise up just does not, does not offer itself to them, except for a very handful, because the white employers will not hire them, white patrons will not patronize if they set up a shop. So this notion of opportunity does not apply to the free black population of the North in any significant way. Nor, of course, does it apply to women. Um, now, women, uh, this is the era, as we said before, of the you know, the cult of domesticity or the notion of separate spheres, the role of women is to remain in the home. The world of the market is for men, and the, the realm of the home is where women should, you know, exercise their authority. Um, but women did work, of course, for wages. Many of them did. Some worked in the home, taking in sewing and things like that. Some of them moved, um, let me get my... Some of them moved out of the home into uh, workshops. Here's a late 1850s image from Harper's Weekly of women working in a, uh, a shoe manufacturing place. They are all on their little tables and they're kind of sewing the top and the bottom of the shoe together. This is the women are working. These are women working for wages and yet the free labor ideology doesn't apply to them because the notion of women achieving independence doesn't make sense. The role of women is to get married and therefore be dependent. And women working is considered a sort of anomaly uh, and uh, a very temporary condition it's supposed to be. Um, and so this notion of a free labor society offering opportunity does not apply in most people's eyes to women, although there are women at this time you know, the early feminists, Elizabeth Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, who are claiming those same rights for women, and they will increasingly do that in the, as the Civil War era goes along. But if you look at this, putting aside the gender of the workers, if you look at this workshop, you see what I was talking about before about a lot of manufacturing. 
This is, the, what's new here is they are gathered together in a large workshop. Some merchant who is producing a lot of shoes is gathering these workers together in one place to oversee them better. Previously, shoemaking took place in people's homes and shops. It was very dispersed. It's not a highly skilled task. And it was done by thousands and thousands of shoemakers all over the place. By this time, they're gathered together in these workshops. But the work is the same. You see, there is no technological development here. There's no machinery, really. There's no, it's still human power. Machine power has not replaced human power in this shoe workshop. So they're doing traditional work, but in a different setting, a different social setting where they are uh, overseen by, instead of in their own little shop, like male shoe workers, they're overseen by a uh, employer, etc. But uh, anyway, my main point is that the free labor ideology is a limited ideology in that sense, but nonetheless it has enormous appeal to white men throughout the North, who are, of course, the voting, the voting uh, population. The panic of 1857, when this economic, great economic progress halted for a while in the panic of 1857, uh, led to a revival, and this will be important as we'll see in politics, of this homestead idea, that the way out of unemployment, the way out of um, unfavorable economic conditions is to go to the West, the West as a safety valve. Long before Frederick Jackson Turner in the 1890s put forward his idea of the West as a safety valve for discontent in the East, people were saying that in the 1850s. Um, excess workers would be drained off. Um, the, the West as a, as a safety valve applies not just to farmers, but to urban workers too. And often it's not, it's not, I don't want to go west, I want you to go west. I want my competitor to go west. And then my wages will go up because there'll be more of a labor shortage. But this is the, the, homestead, the homestead agitation is trying to deal with the contradiction of the emergence of a permanent wage-earning working class in a society where there's supposed to be all this upward mobility. And that's one of the reasons why, as I said before, the question of the expansion of slavery is so important. Because if slavery goes out and takes over Kansas and Nebraska and all these places, westward migration will be stopped. It's not, it, here's my point. It's not just the slave system that is trying to expand. It is the free labor system also. You have two expanding economies, two economies where ideologically each thinks expansion is necessary for our survival. Because if expansion to the West is blocked off, what will happen? Class divisions will increase in the East. Opportunity for advancement will decrease in the East. And, and to use a phrase of the time, we will, we will uh, descend to European conditions. The image of Europe is like Manchester, England, you know, a giant factory city with horrible conditions for the working class and tremendous class uh, inequalities. That's what will, that's the fate that American society will face, Northern society, if westward expansion is cut off. So the more people talk about land in the West, the more there is this inherent conflict between slave society and free society over what is going to happen with those Western uh, territories.